STS! In the 1980s, teen comedies ruled the multiplexes. Movies like The Breakfast Club, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and Valley Girl lit the screen on fire for crowds of the newly minted mall generation. The film spoke to that generation and kept them laughing the entire time. In 1985, a new filmmaker hit the scene and was able to recruit a young up-and-coming star to be in his quirky black comedy dealing with something everyone can identify with. Heartbreak. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Better Off Dead has become a cult hit, but it wasn't without some bumps in the road, both during and after filming. So let's find out exactly what the f happened to this movie. Steve Holland, affectionately known as Savage Steve Holland after he kicked a kid in the teeth during a soccer game, had some buzz coming out of film school for his student project Going Nowhere Fast where it was exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art. His first job was animating the whammies on the game show Press Your Luck. Most would remember how contestants would yell out, no whammies, no whammies, stop, as they pressed their button to get it to stop on the prize they wanted. If they were unfortunate enough to get a whammy, then little red guys would come out of the screen and cause mischief in one form or another. Outside of this, Holland was still making short films and had one called My 11-Year-Old Birthday Party play at the LA Film Festival. One person in attendance who loved the short was Henry Winkler. Yes, the Fonz loved his film. And when he learned that Holland was getting ready to direct his first feature film, he said he should check out John Cusack in The Sure Thing. Winkler had produced the film and thought Cusack would be perfect for the lead role. Holland agreed and quickly got a hold of him. Cusack agreed to be in the film and they were all set. At least they thought so. The studio didn't exactly see Cusack as a leading man after seeing him in films like Sixteen Candles, where he played a geeky sidekick. Holland fought back, saying that Cusack would be perfect for the role. After going back and forth and not seeing a compromise, the studio finally gave in. Better Off Dead was on its way. How come? Because I'm the Fonz, huh? Hey! <laughs> In the film, Cusack plays Lane Meyer, who was just dumped by his girlfriend. He laments their broken relationship as he decides on multiple occasions to kill himself. Each time, he fails miserably and quite hilariously. Around all this, he has to do the things teenagers usually do, like homework, finding a job, and getting challenged to a downhill ski race by the jock bully of the high school who's also now dating his ex-girlfriend. I was wondering if you would mind if I took out Beth? You know, teenage stuff. This is a bit awkward. The film is loaded with dark comedy that also somehow leans into a slapstick nature that works perfectly. A few notable things in the film are Lane being stalked by the local paperboy who wants the $2 he's owed, being followed by two exchange students who want to race him but only speak like Howard Cosell from the wide world of sports, and finding out that his younger brother can pick up women better than he can. It's a quirky movie. Holland made sure to surround Cusack with some fun supporting characters that really push the quirkiness of the film. Diane Franklin plays a French foreign exchange student that lives across the street from Lane. Her French accent is pushed to the hilarious extreme that she keeps confusing words that sound familiar. As Lane's best friend Charles DeMar, Curtis Armstrong was cast fresh off Risky Business and Revenge of the Nerds. Charles is the strange guy that you see wearing a top hat for no reason, but is unshakably loyal. He's able to laugh off the bully's insults so well that it leaves them confused what to do next. And he probably has the best quotes of the entire film. His ski lessons are something we live by. Fans of Head of the Class will recognize Dan Schneider as the weirdo next door neighbor Ricky. His mother signed him up to host an exchange student in their house just so he might have a shot at getting a girlfriend. She practically pushes them into an arranged marriage throughout the movie, but thankfully she's able to escape that horrendous living situation by helping Lane soup up his Camaro. The biggest mystery of the film is Lane's brother Badger, played by Scooter Stevens. He has no lines in the entire film, but comes off as an intriguing figure. He's been cutting the backs off of all the cereal boxes in the house to send away for prizes. This causes numerous messes throughout the house. Before we even find out what that even amounts to, we see a horrible mailman delivering him a book he sent away for on how to pick up trashy women. Later, we see him hosting a social gathering in his room with a bunch of ladies that are older than he is. Finally, it's revealed that with all the cereal boxes, 
toolboxes, he is somehow able to build a rocket ship that bursts out of the family home. This badger is truly a man of mystery that could rival James Bond himself. Savage Steve Holland has said that most of the film is weirdly autobiographical. His high school girlfriend actually left him for the ski team captain, and he was suicidal for a short time. He says he went into his garage and put an extension cord over a pipe. As he stood on a plastic garbage can wondering if he really wanted to go through with it, the lid on the can broke. He fell, but the pipe also broke. Water began to pour down from the broken pipe, and now he was lying in a garbage can that was about to fill up with water as his mom came out to yell at him for breaking the water pipe. He saw the hilarity in the situation and began to write down all the dumb ways suicides could fail. These ideas became the idea for Better Off Dead. To help everyone feel better, his ex-girlfriend did call him after the film came out and apologized to him. Man, now that's a real shame when folks be throwing away a perfectly good white boy like that. Another aspect that seemed so far-fetched that it couldn't have been true was the psychotic paperboy. But in real life, he also had a paperboy that would harass him for two bucks. Surely he didn't go to quite the lengths the fictional one did, but the actor who played the paperboy made sure he took it very seriously. When Demian Slade came into audition, he wore a leather jacket and made himself look as menacing as possible. He said he approached it as if he was a serial killer, dead serious with no intention of making it funny, and it worked perfectly for the part. Holland's mother also liked to experiment with her cooking. He said she was constantly trying to make new meals from recipes she got out of McCall's magazine. They would taste really bad, and she would always have an excuse that she forgot an ingredient or replaced something that they didn't have. Here's hoping that the raisin goop we saw in the movie was an exaggeration. One thing that wasn't an exaggeration was that his mom had actually given him TV dinners for Christmas one year. She said it was because she knew he liked the peach cobbler in that specific one. As they were filming, they still hadn't filled the role of the jock bully. Holland was in his office looking at some dailies when a blonde haired guy walked in. He took one look at Steve and asked the casting agent, who's the fat surfer? Holland was stunned and asked who this guy was. He was introduced to Aaron Dozier, who was coming in to audition for Roy. Steve looked at him and said, you have the part. You're perfect. Not a good idea to insult your director, but I guess it depends on the part you're auditioning for. One thing Holland wanted to include in the film was during the period when Lane is working at the fast food restaurant. When Holland worked at McDonald's, there was a rumor that a rat fell into the fryer and got served to someone. He thought it would be a funny story to put in the film, but his producer said it was just gross and not funny. Instead, he came up with the claymation scene of the hamburger playing guitar to Van Halen's Everybody Wants Some. Hey, hey, get some, baby! Get some! Get some! It was a weird scene in the movie, and not everyone thought it was a good idea. But when it came time to test the movie, that scene tested higher than anything else. Holland ended up being a studio's dream as the movie came in under budget and under schedule. Cusack enjoyed his time on the movie so much he signed up for Holland's next film, One Crazy Summer. That film went into pre-production as they were editing Better Off Dead. Once the film was locked, they held a special screening for the cast and crew. After 20 minutes, Cusack got up and left the theater enraged. The next morning, he walked up to Holland and said it was the worst film he had ever seen. He felt that Holland had lied to him about what the movie was supposed to be, that he could never trust him as a director again and never speak to him again. Steve asked what was wrong, but Cusack said that he sucked as a director and that he used him. Holland was so shocked by this as it seemed to come out of nowhere. Cusack did finish One Crazy Summer because he was contractually obligated, but wasn't happy during the filming. The question then is, what movie did he feel like he was making? A crazy paperboy asking for his $2, exchange students trying to drag race him, and Raisin Goop literally walking off his plate should have been a clue to the film's tone. Despite all this, during a 2013 interview, Cusack stated he didn't hate the movie or making the film. He said he wishes some things were better, but also feels this way about all of his movies. All said and done, Cusack is happy that the movie has fans and a cult audience. He never did work with Holland again after One Crazy Summer, though. The film ended up being a modest hit. On less than a $4 million budget, it ended up with a box office of just over $10 million. For 1985, that's not too shabby. Critics weren't huge fans, though. And this is one of those movies where you sit there saying, not only do I know what's going to happen, right. but it's going to be so boring that I won't even be amused by the fact that I knew it was going to happen. On an episode of Siskel and Ebert, the two derided the film, saying it was a formulaic teen comedy. Both said they wished they could forget the movie entirely and felt that it had nothing to say. Then, you see that the window broken once, you see it broken twice, you see it broken three times, 
That's the whole pattern of the movie. What did this director think was funny? Yeah, Doesn't yeah. that director realize that we all know it's going to break again? That that's stupid and that make, he makes himself well, look stupid? When they showed a clip, it was a strange scene where Lane's mom is serving dinner in honor of Monique's French nationality. She serves French fries, French dressing, French bread, and Perrier water. This as Ricky's mom accidentally drinks kerosene and blows up the dinner table when she goes to light a cigarette. That old story we've seen time and time again. The film, this kid who rides by every day yeah. breaking the window, is even in the last shot of the movie as if he has some kind of Fellini-esque alter oh, ego. For... Don't use the word Fellini in anywhere near this film. I'm sorry, I really <laughs> must apologize to Fellini and to Eugene for okay. doing that. The Miami Herald was less harsh than the others, but said it had, quote, the body of a tired teen comedy, but the soul of an inspired student film. Since its release, it has gained that cult following. It seems that time has caught up with the film as it now sits at a solid 87% on Rotten Tomatoes' audience score. Maybe the adults at the time didn't know how to deal with this movie, but the younger generation remember it as a fun, dark satire of love in high school. The film hasn't aged as badly as some of its contemporaries from the time period, but some problems have nothing to do with the movie itself. While this piece of information isn't directly tied to the film, it does cast a dark cloud over anything Dan Schneider is involved with. Schneider would go on to be a cast member on the sitcom Head of the Class. From there, he would get into writing and producing. Most famously, his company, Schneider's Bakery, would work closely with Nickelodeon to create some of the most recognizable shows on the network, like All That, Keenan and Kel, The Amanda Show, and iCarly. For the last decade or so, there have been rumblings that Schneider was abusive on set with the actors and production team. When asked about the accusations, he said if he had been rough with people on set, it was because he had high expectations as a showrunner. Multiple people complained about his attitude and his weird habit of posting pictures of his young star's feet on Twitter. There were rumors for years that more could have been going on behind the scenes, but nothing has been confirmed. In 2018, Nickelodeon finally cut ties with Schneider and his company after an internal investigation found multiple issues dealing with Schneider's temper toward his co-workers. Schneider was prone to temper tantrums and angry emails when he didn't get his way. Nothing of sexual nature was found during the investigation. Other actors and employees would come forward after the investigation was over and claim that there was a lot of gender discrimination. He would constantly ask female employees for massages. Someone close to Schneider says that Dan regretted asking for such things as he realized it was inappropriate. Even with these few dark behind the scenes issues, Better Off Dead remains a cult classic from the 1980s. This quirky and somewhat dark film has brought joy to so many over the years. At least we can all rest easy knowing Lane didn't end up killing himself and found the girl of his dreams. Even though she probably had to go back to France not long after the movie ended. I don't know, what happened then? What would you like to say to the people of the 21st century, huh? E. Yeah.